Hi, Ramona. How are you? Welcome to What If I Say Yes. I'm good. Thank you, Lucia. So lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. So, Ramona, please tell the audience, who are you? Hmm, interesting question. Okay, my name is Ramona Lal. Um, I currently live in Brooklyn, New York with my husband Pontus and my two boys who are Felix, he's nine, and Jules, he's six. Um, I'm originally from India and I moved to the US to come to college. Uh, my family still lives in India, so I'm kind of a little bit, you know, there and over here. Uh, so that kind of gives you a nutshell who I am. I if you want to know more about my professional life, I'm uh, an epidemiologist at the New York City Department of Health. Um, and I've been there for several years now. And my background is environmental health. That's what I did my graduate studies in. Okay. So now tell the audience how we know each other. What do you remember? Yes. So I've had the pleasure of meeting Lucia and her husband, Carlos many, many years ago when I lived in Jersey City. I was in grad school back then, and we were both on the third floor of an old building, and we were neighbors. And I met Carlos for the first time when he locked himself out of his house and needed to get in through our window, our fire escape. Uh, and then I had the pleasure of getting to know both Carlos and Lucia over the time, and even had the pleasure of driving Lucia to the to the hospital when they when they were ready to deliver their beautiful baby <laughs> yes so funny um i didn't remember the part about carlos being locked out what i remembered um and i don't know if it happened you'll tell me is that carlos met you first but then um you had come to ask for sugar or something like it was a very neighborly thing that you see in the movies or in the TV shows and you knock on the door and you have some sugar because <laughs> so that may have happened after you met him. I don't know. Um, and yes, I mean, there were only two apartments per floor. So you were mm -hmm. in front of us. Um, and we and were both doing our PhDs, Carlos and me. So we had a lot in common and we worked from home a lot. So we did bump into each other quite frequently. Mm -hmm. You met my brother, Hector. Um, I don't know if you remember him, but was, uh, we, you may have been there. Were you there when Carlos turned 40? Um, I may have been in India, but I do know I met your parents. Yes, I remember you sent me a picture from India. You're correct. Yes. Yes. And so, well, we became dear, dear friends. And yes, you were the one who drove. So my mom was with us. Yep. So you in the car, it must have been my mom, Carlos. Yeah. You and I. Yes. Going from Jersey City to yes. um, NYU, NYU Medical Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Cross town. Yes. Um, so, yes, you, you were... Um, in charge of driving us safely. <laughs> no, I remember going to your baby shower and you guys were talking about taking the subway. And I was like, no, no, there's no need to take the subway. You just have to let me know. And I'm so <laughs> glad you did. <laughs> yes. I can't imagine having had to do that, like taking the path and then the subway and then walking. Like <laughs> Now I know how they... Um, labor pain feels like like no it was a really bad idea um so anyway yes and then you moved out no we moved out first you did move first yeah we left um we left for texas and then but it, since then we kept in touch mm -hmm. we came back to new york city new york city sometime and i remember having seen you and Pontus and I think you already have. I think I was pregnant baby. with my second son, but you met my older boy. Mm -hmm. in, in Central Park. Yeah. So yes, we have been friends, very good friends since a while. Yeah. So Ramona, mm -hmm. um, 
what was a moment in your life when you asked the question, what if I say yes? You said yes, and you did something. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very interesting because when you, when I was thinking about that question, I was thinking about times where I was at the crossroads of life. So whether it was leaving India to come to um, uh, come to America to pursue studies, um, it was also the time in Jersey City when I had to make a decision whether I would stay in academia or should I move on uh, and get a job that paid me better. Um, and, you know, funnily enough, I'm finding myself at a crossroad again, where we have been in Brooklyn now for 12 years, and it is becoming way too expensive to be living here. Um, and so, and our boys are growing up and we need more space, you know, the usual story. Uh, so, you know, we're kind of at a crossroad now and sometimes wonder, am I still brave enough to make, you know, a leap of faith and do something different? Um, it's exciting, but, you know, it's also a little, makes me a little bit more scared because there are so many more pieces to, uh, to life now. We have kids, we have, you know, I have a husband, you know, I have family, friends. But when I thought about this question, when you first raised it, it brought me back to when I was a postdoc at NYU. Mm -hmm. And I spent three years trying to pursue my dream, which was to do air quality research in India. And so I was very fortunate that I got to spend a couple of months in India in two different research centers trying to see if I could build my own research. And you know, it, it was a time where there was not a lot of funding. And so it was really hard and a life of an academic, especially if you're doing research is extremely hard. All you do is chase after grants. And so I was getting a feel of that. And so here I was at this crossroad where do I pursue my dreams or do I have new dreams? And, and so I, I do recall the precise moment where I thought to myself, like, what if I said yes? Really? You know? Yes. So I had, I, you know, it was a very interesting time. I had just, um, you know, been in touch with my undergrad professor and he had this opportunity for me to go to Uzbekistan uh, and on a trip with other researchers and spent three weeks traveling through the country to go to the Aral Sea, which is the sea that disappeared because of mismanagement of water. And so we were going to go study the, you know, study this as a case study for climate change. And so, I, you know, I had said, you know, that was another time when I just kept saying, yes, yes, I will come. Yes. And so finally he said, are you coming? And I was like, oh, my God, yes, I'm coming. Uh, so I had said yes to that. And then at the same time, I had uh, I was in conversation about getting the job that I'm currently in now. And, you know, there was this one amazing week where I didn't know which way I was going. And I was talking to like everybody who was important in my life at that moment to see where I should what I should do next. Um, so there was a professor in India and she told me, if you turn back now, there's no looking back. I had got a small grant from India. And so I met with her and I explained to her my own situation, that it was a struggle. I was the main earner of the family. I wanted to maybe have children. And she understood and she said, you just have to do what you have to do, you know. And so I had that going on. I was going to Uzbekistan and had, I had to answer to the Department of Health whether I wanted to take this job that would pay me three times what I was currently making. And I was like, how could I not take it? And so, you know, it was this real moment where everything was like coming together. So it was a pretty intense period in my life. And I remember the moment I said yes to the government job. It was the most, it was the most strange phenomena. I, as I said yes, my stomach opened out and I released all the stress. And so my body was telling me, even though my mind was so, you know, holding on to what what I thought I wanted, my body was telling me something very different. And so that was a one time that I decided to go with my body rather than my mind. And, you know, uh, so, so that's what I thought of when you asked me that question. That wow. Moment. So now, 
Was it the first time in your life when you made a, like a, such an important decision based on how your body felt? Or you had had a previous experience? You know, that was probably the first time I was conscious that my body made a decision. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, through my graduate studies, through my, you know, I, I kept pushing myself and I wasn't listening to myself, you know, because I was just focused on this one direction that I was going to go. Um, and maybe that was the first, like that was the first time I put myself in such a situation that my body and mind were not, they were not uh, in, what's the word? You know, they, they were not both in tune with each other. They were they were wanting two different things. And so, since then, have you have you used that or whatever you learned from that from that trusting in any other situations in your life or with your kids? Um, you know, I don't think I've had anything that stressful to be honest in the last decade or so um you know there was a time that there was one other time that i had to make a decision i was teaching a course at nyu and my second son had just been born and i had been out of the field for a couple of years so i had said yes i would teach the course and then two weeks before i was like there's no way i can like it was, I was like putting so much pressure on myself. And I think that's the whole thing that I've realized that I have this habit of putting like, you know, trying to be an overachiever and like push myself to achieve these things. And there comes a point and I have sleepless nights and I'm like, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. And so since that, since that first, you know, awakening, I have, come to understand that when it comes to a situation like that, you probably don't want to do it because if it's causing that much, um, you know, some things might be worth it. You know, maybe stress is good for you and it's worth it and it helps you achieve things. But it was like a level of stress that, you know, I was like, it's, it, I can't do so many things. I'm not a superwoman. I can, you know, I have so many things going on um, I have to pick and choose and I have to see what's important. And I have to also ask myself, like, why am I chasing after this particular thing? Is it, do I really want it or do I think I want it? Mm -hmm. So when you, when you were at that point, either when you had to decide whether to go to Uzbekistan or take this job, mm -hmm. how many years ago was that? Oh, but Lucy, I did go to Uzbekistan. Uh, it was whether I was going to stay on in academia and from a postdoc, try and become a research pro assistant professor and then follow that life. Uh, um, it, it's just that in that week, I had said yes to many things. And so I did go to Uzbekistan and it was the most amazing experience of my life. And um, uh, so, but when I came back, I started the government job and that's what I said yes to and I left behind the idea of doing research in India. Oh, okay. So I misunderstood. So you did go, okay, because oh, I wanted yeah. to ask you what had happened to that amazing study. So what, tell us first, what happened in Uzbekistan? Oh my God, it, it was like, it, it's one of the things that sometimes deep down, I wish I had gone like a few years earlier so I would have understood like the, you know, I, it would have maybe changed the trajectory of how I approached the kind of idea to do research in India. Like maybe I would have, you know, applied for a, a faculty position somewhere in the country and then had a small research project to do in India. But I was kind of going with the NYU idea where you only do research and it's like you, you, you know, you constantly apply for multi-million dollar grants and things. <laughs> yes. But I did go to Uzbekistan and it was a life changing experience. It was um, it's something that I still some days think like I could write a book about. I've taken wonderful photographs. I've painted from those photographs and I would love to like Monday showcase them somewhere. Um, 
But what we learned on that study is that there were two main rivers that flow into the Aral Sea. They're called Sir Darya and Amu Darya. And back during the Soviet period um, in the 70s, you know, their focus in Uzbekistan, like Moscow had, you know, mandated that Uzbekistan should be growing cotton. And so they were diverting the rivers, um, you know, to, to water and for the cultivation of cotton. And so these rivers were not feeding into the sea and slowly, gradually, the sea started disappearing. And so there are these, you know, horrifying satellite images that show you over time how this, you know, inland sea shrank into like nothing. So we actually uh, arrived in Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, and then we went on to Samarkand. And in Samarkand, we met a group of uh, Uzbek researchers, mm -hmm. and we got on a bus with them, and we traveled for three weeks to the sea. Mm -hmm. And it was 1,600 kilometers away. And mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, and we were in a desert. Most of the period, we were driving through a desert. Mm -hmm. And we got to the down with the sea and you know what you see when you go there is like just like vast land where the sea was and these old ships just lying on the shore um, <laughs> of where once the sea was um, and then there was this amazing museum where they have documented all that was happening when this town was vibrant it was a huge fishing village uh, you know it had lots of uh, tourism so it was a thriving uh, town, and once the sea disappeared, there was mass migration. And but today, there's still about ten thousand people who live there, mm -hmm. but there's nothing there, you know. And so there's no water, no, not a drop of water. Not a drop of water. It's mm -hmm. it, it's all gone. Yeah. And so you went there. You had this amazing experience. Yeah. You came back. That was a moment when you were trying to decide which way to go. So I actually, the day before I left for Uzbekistan, I said yes to the job oh. at the health department. So it's just to show you like so much was happening in those few days. Like I always look back and I'm like, wow, like it was a very intense few days. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I said yes. And I said yes to the trip. I said yes to the job. It was like just, doing something else other than what I had been doing because I had been at NYU doing research for 12 years. So it was a long period of time. And so, and I just felt ready for something new, mm -hmm. you know? And with the health job, with the Department of Health job, I had to be a resident in New York City. So it was like, we'd have to move. And so I would now become a New Yorker. So there were all these different things, you know, that were changing, like just because of those few days. When you said yes, was that a phone call? Was that an email? Was that? It was over the phone. Over the phone. Okay. Yeah. So you said yes over the phone and then? And the next day I was on a plane going to Uzbekistan. Um, and I just remember uh, I had a, my one of my closest college friends from Poland visiting and my other- No, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm getting so confused. You said yes before going to Uzbekistan? Yes. I thought, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting all wrong today. I thought you had said yes the day before coming back from having been in Uzbekistan. No, no, sorry, sorry. I said yes, and the next day I went to Uzbekistan. Okay. So, and you had to say yes, so that was your deadline, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you went to Uzbekistan to have this wonderful experience, knowing that when you came back, you were going to do something. I would start a new life. Completely different. How, how was the beginning of this job? How did you feel doing this completely new thing in your life? You know what? Actually, there were two sides to it. It wasn't so simple. There was one side that of me that was kind of maybe in mourning mm -hmm. because I had put in so much work and so much love into a dream and I had to put aside the dream. Um, and there was curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to see what I could be doing, you know, and I was working on a big team of analysts. 
So that was fun because till then I had only worked with my professor and it was just two of us who had worked together for 12 years. So now I had like a team of people, you know, I could make new friends. Um, uh, but the work was a lot simpler than what I had been doing. And in a way, I didn't mind. Um, it was also a very change of pace in life because when I was at NYU, um, you know, I was working through the evening. Sometimes late at night, I would be trying to finish up something. There were no like, there were no boundaries. But there when was I came, no nine to five. No, but when I came to the Department of Health, it was a nine to five job. And I was not used to that. I would come home at five and I would stare at the walls and I'd be like, oh, what am I supposed to do now? You know, because, mm -hmm. and in my head, it would come to be like, oh, what should I be doing now? What should I be doing now? And then sometimes I'd be like, I can do nothing, <laughs> you know, which was kind of nice. And so I went through a period where I started painting and I would come home every day from work and I would find one object in my house and I would paint it. And so I, you know, it was, it was, it felt like it was a place to recover because I had been through a lot. It was very intense, my years in graduate school. Um, and, you know, so it was a place that I could recover, rediscover new things, mm -hmm. you know, reestablish friendships. Um, yeah. What kind of objects did you paint? Oh my goodness, anything. Like little like what? vases, some flowers, um, you know, you know, my kettle, my teapots. Um, I have a little Buddha statue. I painted the Buddha statue. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I also got busy because I was teaching the course at NYU. And I we were writing a book for those based on those Uzbekistan trips. So I had to write a chapter for a book. So I was busy with that. But there was a lot more I wanted to do with those Uzbekistan tr trips. So I started thinking about maybe I want to make a, like a um, write a script for a film mm -hmm. uh, about our trip because it was it was that you know life changing. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to do that. Uh, and so I started doing some research around that and I started, you know, looking through my photographs to get ideas about the story plot. Um, I started painting from my photographs, um, but then I ended up having two boys and so a lot of my time has been taken over <laughs> looking after them. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is something that is there that I would like to do something with it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when I have a quiet moment, I think about it and I think about how I could do it. But I haven't gotten there yet where I can make it like, you know, make make something of it. Mm -hmm. That's a future. What if I say yes moment? Yes. <laughs> so. You have been working at this new, this not new job, this job. And then the pandemic hit. Tell us all about it. <laughs> okay, so I work in the Bureau of Communicable Diseases. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, when this hit, it hit us really hard. And so, you know, in a matter of weeks, we had to like set up to make sure our surveillance, we could track cases and hospitalizations and deaths and to be able to report this online. And so having or putting all these systems together, I mean, initially it was also like trying to understand whether COVID was here already or, you know, were we looking for the initial case or was it already, there was already local transmission. So there was a lot going on. And at the same time, it was a period of so many unknowns. So today when I look back, I'm like, oh, you know, we knew, we now know this, we now know that. But at that point, we didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was really stressed out. And we live in a small apartment in New York City. So in every room, there was a different classroom or office space happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we kind of, you know, got through each day trying not to think about how much longer we would have to do it, because I think if you thought about that, it could break you. So we just kept thinking about, OK, we just what do we have to do today? You know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so the first month and a half was very intense. We didn't we didn't even leave the house. So I hadn't been out in my apartment for like six weeks. And then finally we went to the beach. 
for a walk. And then we discovered, oh, we can be doing this. So then every weekend we were out on a hike. We were at the beach. And actually, it was wonderful. We became a hiking family. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't do that anymore. It's gone full back to like social events on the weekend and, uh, you know, kids sports and stuff like that. But yeah, we, the, the pandemic, I mean, when I think back now, I'm like that those first six, eight months were very, very intense. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how you mention once you started this job and the nine to five and then the, the free time and the time to rediscover and trying to recover from all the stress you've had in your, in your um, academic life. Yeah. And then boom, <laughs> boom, you get this new kind of stress that I don't know if you can compare it or not. Not really. <laughs> No. Huge stress in your life for Huge. you and for your entire family and the world. Yeah. And, you know, you're worrying because you have parents in India, you have family, friends everywhere. You know, it's like you're not sure what's happening. We don't know how it's going to have, affect you. So, you know, there were like so many things to think about. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Okay. So, um, well, first, you mentioned that you did write a chapter for another book or some, an edited book, I guess, it's, about it's, Uzbekistan. Uh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But you still have this project of one day doing some like a solo a book only by yourself. Yes. Um, when is this going to happen? When, when so do you think that... I have, I have two ideas. Actually, I have three ideas for this. So one is to just publish... The photographs and that's probably the simplest idea just you know go through my collection of photographs i have like i have like thousands of pictures i took um and edit them and you know publish archive them, them in a book publish them in a book yeah okay. the other idea was my first idea where i thought like i would make a graphic novel for kids <laughs> about this you know so to learn about the rlc sea but to you know because it was interesting we went there to learn lessons for climate change mm -hmm. and actually but what ended up happening is like we learned just more about that particular problem i don't know if we were able to fully apply it to climate change but i think what got to me at that point is that here was such a such a dedicated team of people mm -hmm. you know and we had these high ideals of you know trying to address climate change and then at the same time we're just these small players and we what power do we have to make anything shift you know um so you you know because after doing many many years of research and you're just feeling like all your effort is coming to nothing you know there's a it can like there's a despondency and there's like a you know there's there's, you know, it's it's kind of draining, you know, mm -hmm. and so, but then yet it takes every individual to make something happen and you cannot fall into that hole of despair, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to keep going back and, and how do we reach people, how, you know, through our human stories, through connection, you know, and, and so we just have to keep going. You can't just say that, oh, because it's not working, I have to stop. You just keep going. And, and that's what inspired me among the group of people that I was with, that they just kept going and they kept pursuing their dream. They kept pushing forward. Um, so I kind of wanted to capture that kind of the conflict there is, but also just capture some of like, you know, it's not easy, you know, but we keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I wanted to... The, the little bit of sadness that there is in that and also how, you know, like the human connections provide hope. So I kind of wanted to like have those as themes. And then I thought that may be hard in a graphic novel. I wouldn't even know how to do that. So then I started thinking about maybe it's more of a form of a film, you know? Oh. Yes. 
So I thought about writing a screenplay where it would be a story. And actually, the story is about the people. It's not about the climate change. It's about the people who are navigating this life. And they have these dreams and ideals. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it takes you on their journey. Um, yeah. So how are you going to decide which way you go? All I three know, are maybe, super maybe, interesting. Maybe I do all three. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, Lucia, I get very excited when I talk about it. And so I feel like, you know, and I, when life has been on the quieter side, which it hasn't been in a few years, I spend time thinking about this. Like if I'm on a bus or a train, I think about it. I go there and I'd be like, oh, so how would I write this story? You know, okay. um, but unfortunately, time is not on my side right now. I have too many competing needs. Um, but interestingly, my mother-in-law, she's in her 70s and she's just published her first trilogy. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe in my retirement. <laughs> but I would like to get to it sooner if I could. I would love to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just thinking of having kids maybe for when they go to college? Maybe. <laughs> you have your, your empty nest. Yes. Full of projects, of creative projects around you. Yes. But you know, the world is changing so fast. And I'm sometimes think like, you know, where will we be at that point when they're in college in 10 years? That's true. You know, true. You know will that story that I have in my head still be relatable mm -hmm. to a new generation? And so, so carving a little bit of time every day or during the weekends or asking your family for a day, a one day a month to mm -hmm. work on your projects, would that be feasible? Would that be negotiable? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have looked into doing a course just to get like some help and also to use it as a place to have a starter project. So that's something I could work with. I have talked about it to some of my friends who are authors and filmmakers, and they get excited. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, if you're excited, then even I'm even more excited. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I am already excited. Oh, <laughs> I want to see the book and the graphic novel and the, and the film. So yeah, it's definitely something that you should pursue. Okay, we're approaching because I promised I'm, I was gonna. Um, let you go to do your thing and your job. Yeah. Let's switch. Well, before we switch to the moment uh, in your life when you decided that saying no was a better option. What is your reflection of that yes that you said that many years ago now? You know, I would, you know, I can't say I don't think about that. <clears throat> I do think about it. And I'm happy, you know, how things turned out. You know, I'm very fortunate to have my two boys. And, you know, I don't know if I could have done it if I had pushed on to be in academia, like the stress and pressure, the finances. So, um, You know, looking back, the only thing I do have a little bit regret is that I was a bit stubborn, you know, mm -hmm. and I, so a lot of my, one of my same undergrad professor who took me to Uzbekistan, I mean, he he's an amazing human being. Uh, he kept, you know, I, I wish I had kept in touch with him more because he, he was, he was someone who like celebrated everything I did. And he was he was my sounding board, you know, um, and so he would, he was constantly trying to getting, getting me a teaching job in my undergrad school. And, you know, if I had listened to him, that would have been a good option for me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't because I wanted to do something different and I was stubborn. Mm -hmm. So, um, so sometimes I regret I didn't listen to him and try it and maybe give it a shot. You know, mm -hmm. um, so looking back, 
sometimes I regret the way I, you know, the way I arrived at that decision. Like there could have been other avenues, but I was very stubborn about what I wanted. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so, but at the same time, I'm, a, I'm content with how things turned out. So it's all right. Yeah. So if we look at you were in this path and then you decided to take this other path, does the first path, um, did it end? Or is it a path that you can retake later in life? And that's what in, I'm asking. In any way. I'm asking myself now. Um, because I've come to that crossroad again and we don't know where we're going to move to next. Mm -hmm. We might even move out of the country. And if that happened, I would be curious to see if there's a way for me to get back to that path. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and so that excites me a little bit. Like, hmm, what if I could end up doing research in India? Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's been a long time since I have, but you know, I'm I'm just like I'm prepared for it. I studied for it, you know, okay. so I should be able to. Um, but yeah, it, 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 no, it's it's definitely it hasn't ended. It did feel like it had ended when I said yes to my job, mm -hmm. and I and I did feel like I was leaving behind something. Um, but I come to a point now in my life that maybe, maybe there is a way to go back to it. Okay. And so, and also going back to the moment when you listen to your body, when you think of this possibility, how does your body feel? Oh, it's stressed. <laughs> it's stressed. <laughs> Stomach is definitely not open. Uh, because, you know, there are so many possibilities now, like we could do this, we could do that. I am a little bit risk averse. Mm -hmm. So I like to take, you know, the the known path. Mm -hmm. So the unknown path is a little bit uh, scary, you know, so okay. it's me out. But I'm trying to change that where I, I, I say, like, I don't have to deal with everything today. It's a process. And we go through the process day by day and you learn. Mm -hmm. And as you go, you learn and you listen to yourself, you listen to your mind, you listen to your body, you see the conversation going on inside, see what you're avoiding, you know, mm -hmm. and then slowly you'll come to terms with it and you'll know when something is right. Mm -hmm. Your body will tell you. Your mind may fight it, but your body will tell you. Okay. Well, good luck with that decision. Um, Thank you. But I'm sure that whatever you decide, you're going to be fine. <laughs> Knowing you, everything is going to be fine. So Ramona, now let's switch to the moment in your life when you decided that saying no was a better option. Hmm. Saying no. I don't know. I can't. I mean, I'm still a little fixated on this one where I had to make a clear no to India research and yes to the job. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a small no. It doesn't have to be life changing, but like a clear no. The first yeah. that comes to mind. I mean, so the one thing is which I kind of mentioned a bit was I was teaching a graduate level course. Mm -hmm. And right when my boy, second son was born, like it, it was just too much for me. And, you know, but it was an important part of my life because it gave me this identity of being an academic and being in research and still having a small hold onto that old life that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I realized it was too much for me and that I couldn't juggle so many things, um, I said no. And I was actually quite happy I said no, because it was a course that I was not particularly, it's not, it's not my passion, it, but, you know, I taught it, it was fine. 
but um, it was not your passion teaching or teaching that specific course teaching that specific course it was environmental measurements and there were parts of it that i enjoyed but you would have to teach like a whole host of different areas and i was not as equipped to teach those other areas so you know i felt more comfortable in the air quality part of it but everything outside of that was was a little like it was not my field so you know and i didn't feel that motivated by it so um so for someone who doesn't have a clue what you're talking about yeah. what is what are those two different um courses or themes that you mentioned so it was an environmental measurements course and it was focused on air sampling and how you collect samples of air pollution for analysis and to you know um understand levels um and composition and things like that uh but i was i'm more interested in like you know how do we control air pollution like how do we make governments make decisions so they can change the way you know things are run so that we have better emissions you More know policy oriented yes so that's kind of but i was interested in doing research to help that policy so this course wasn't really in that area it was a little bit downstream um where it's about collecting that information about air pollution um so you know so i i what the one thing is like i did love teaching i really enjoyed it and i loved interacting with students and you know I, it, it was it was a very great experience mm -hmm. um but that course material itself was a little dull to be honest mm -hmm. um so so I said no, and then I I never looked back because I said, you know, I would be interested in teaching something different. Mm -hmm. you know? I had taught a course many years ago in environmental science, and I really enjoyed that because you could talk about current day issues and then relate it to the science and show how we study it. You you know how we study these issues, and um, you know so that was more like inspiring to me and exciting. Mm -hmm. you know? So now, um, do we still have time? Yes. Okay. Bye. Ten more minutes. <laughs> did I say? Did you say twelve fifty? Yeah, if that's yes. okay. Yes. Okay. Nine more minutes. Okay. So um, when you say it was too much for you, and that's why you decided to say no to that. Describe a day in the life of Ramona with a little kid and teaching that course. What made it be too much? So a lot of, uh, so I'm the kind of person, like it was a three hour lecture. So I'm the kind of person who likes to create like slides. And so for each course, I had like 60, 70 slides. Oh. But I need to study those 70 slides to be able to, you know, be able to present it and, you know, um, but this was information that I did not deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I did not have like practical experience, current practical experience using the instruments that I was talking about. Plus, the course was a little outdated because I had inherited a lot of the course material from a former <laughs> professor who had been teaching that course since the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so... And a lot of the instruments that we were using at NYU at the time was like older, but like, you know how, you know, things have changed overnight in the last few decades, right? So mm -hmm. there were newer instrumentation and I didn't have the time to research those to update my course. So it would require like a lot of work to do it. So, so I have a very tedious process in preparing for a class. Like I immerse myself in the material and I have to know all sides of it. Even though I may not talk about everything, I need to understand everything. And so that's a huge task. Mm -hmm. And so here I was with a nine to five job, you know, then picking up kids, feeding them, bathing them, getting them to bed. And then I would have maybe one or two hours Whereas I actually wanted to have three or four hours a day to do it. And then at that point, I decided, is this something good for me to do? Because, you know, I also need time for myself, you know? Um, so, yeah, it, it, so that would have been like me, you know, working through the night, trying to get the course ready, um, you know, the lectures ready. 
And so yeah, it, to me, it felt very daunting. How many classes did you teach? One of, that course, was that once a week? Was that... No, it, uh, so the course was also offered every other year. So it was not every year. And it was once a week and it was a three and a half hour lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once a week and you had, so to prepare for that three hour lecture, you, how long did it take you to prepare it? How many hours? So the first time I taught it, it took my whole week because I didn't have anything. I had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So the next few times it became easier because I didn't have to start from scratch. But each time I had to review all the material. And, you know, just to give you an idea, Lucia, like I, my background is air quality and health effects. But this course covered radiation. It covered, you know, um, uh, noise pollution. It covered, uh, you know, organic material. So things like uh, that I had less experience with. So I was kind of it's more, more based on me understanding it from literature rather than actually using the instruments myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it, even though I had taught it each year, like, you know, two years later, when it was time to teach it again, I would have to revisit every part of it, you know, and study it in detail again, because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Oh, well, well, good thing you said no. <laughs> So I you just got tired after hearing all you had to do. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we have the last five minutes to um, remind you to send me now whatever pictures, images you would like to share with the audience um, about mm -hmm. your yes and your no. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for having come to What If I Say Yes. Um, somehow today, so these interviews are, I don't know what my guests are going to talk about. And I try to pay as much attention as I can whenever you're talking. But I'm also trying to figure out what questions I can ask you about. Mm -hmm. But this time, Ramona. <laughs> I messed up so many times. Like you went to Uzbekistan and I'm asking you what happened. Sorry, yeah. I, you know, I have this tendency to complicate things. So I can't <laughs> talk about one thing. I have to talk about three things. So I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's also very similar to how Carlos speaks sometimes. And I'm so, I, I am very linear. So I have to understand the, the, the step by step. Yeah. So if you're talking about things that happen and, and then um, my timeline is not clear, then I just make a mess. So my apologies for having messed up um, the things that I messed up. And today. my apologies for complicating it. <laughs> but anyway, the good thing is that we know each other and yeah. nothing is going to change in our friendship. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so any final words you have for um, the what if I say yes idea or future what if I say yes moments that you may have or knows that you may have anything you want to share before we close? So I think this has the, it's just serendipitous that this interview happened today because I have I am entering a period of where I have to make decisions again and it is feeling a bit intense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just the question actually popped in my head, like, what if I said yes? Like, instead of my body getting all stressed out and me thinking all these things, what if I just went with the flow and said yes? Mm -hmm. you know, what if? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to apply that to my life. Okay. Well, that sounds very much like my brother's spirit coming down today and helping you <laughs> with Thank this you. idea. I love it. Thank you. Thank I will you keep so you much. posted. I will keep you posted what happens. Yes, please. All right. <laughs> and I'll wait for pictures. And I, I let you go two minutes before our um, deadline. So good luck with your meeting. Thank you Thank so you. much. I love you, Ramona. Love you too. And my love to Carlos and Maya. Yes. All right.
Okay. Will do. The same to your family. I will. Okay. Bye, Ramona. Bye.